Good afternoon. I'm Julie Sullivan, president of the University of St. Thomas, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first Friday speaker series. Today, we have the unique opportunity to hear from Neil Kashkari, CEO and president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And then Neil will join Dr. Mike Alhong, vice president and founding dean of the Morrison Family College of Health for a conversation about the racial and economic disparities in our education system. But before we move to the main program, I want to share a few updates about the University of St. Thomas. I guess first and foremost, I should say we're open <laughs> and we remain open, knock on wood and say a prayer, at least for now. I want to say that the extraordinary efforts of our faculty and staff really allowed us to launch this academic year with students living and learning on campus. We have almost 2,100 students living in our residence halls and approximately 72% of our undergraduate courses have some in-person component. Our mission of developing morally responsible leaders who advance the common good is predicated on a personalized whole person education, which we all know is best achieved in community with one another. So I am so inspired and uplifted by the great efforts our students, our faculty and our staff are making. They're working so hard to help us stay in community. So please keep us in your prayers as well. I also want to let you know about the new North, North Campus, the North Campus in St. Paul, and you'll see some pictures of it, I think, today on the screens. The North Campus in St. Paul has been truly transformed. We've opened two beautiful new residence halls, a renovated Ireland Hall, a fabulous new dining facility, and an exquisite Iverson Center for Faith. So if you haven't seen the North Campus in person, I encourage you to put a mask on and come over for a stroll. I think you'll find it truly amazing. We also have been helping our students and their families and our community, those members who are most in need. We recently launched a $5 million campaign to raise money for hardship scholarships for our students. These will be scholarships that will help our current students stay in school and graduate. We also created Tommy Corps. Tommy Corps gave our students the opportunity this past summer to go out into the community and to work with the populations in our local community who have been most impacted by the pandemic. Our Catholic values compel us to reject the sin of racism, and they call us to identify, call out, and combat racism in all of its forms. Thus, we are increasing our efforts this year to be an anti-racist campus and to work for justice and equity for all. Some of the things or some of the steps that we'll be taking this year include augmenting our action plan to combat racism, conducting a diversity, equity, and inclusion audit of all of the university's structures, policies, and practices, and expanding the work of the recently launched Racial Justice Initiative led by Dr. Yuhuru Williams. Lastly, I want to recognize and express my gratitude for the enormous effort put forth by St. Thomas students, faculty, and staff to help us stay true to our mission. I believe this academic year will go down as one of the most challenging, yet one of the most fulfilling in our 135 year history. I'm certain that what we are learning today and how we are adapting will continue to propel us forward, will continue to make us better, and will continue to help us become that, or be, I should say, that premier Catholic university that is preparing morally responsible leaders to advance the common good. So thank you for your part in supporting us and praying for us. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Neil Kashkari has been President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis since January 1, 2016. In this role, he also serves on the Federal Open Market Committee, bringing perspective to monetary policy discussions in Washington. 
In addition, Neil oversees the bank's operations and was instrumental in establishing the Minneapolis Fed's Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute, which has a mission to improve the economic well being of all Americans. Neil has worked arduously with his partner, Justice Alan Page, to highlight the systemic inequities in Minnesota's K through 12 schools and to gain support for a state constitutional amendment that established the rights of all Minnesota children to a quality education. Neil earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois, and he went on to become an aerospace engineer. He developed technology for NASA missions. However, with further ambitions, he eventually turned to finance and public policy. And he earned an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, joined Goldman Sachs, and served in several senior positions in the US Department of the Treasury, including overseeing the Troubled Asset Relief Program, commonly known as TARP, during the financial crisis. But before we hear from Neil, Allow me also to introduce Dr. Mai Kao Hong. Mai Kao was appointed Vice President and Founding Dean of the Morrison Family College of Health last fall. She has made great strides in her first year with St. Thomas, including attracting and hiring our first director of our new School of Nursing. Previously, Mai Kao served as President and CEO of the Wilder Foundation, where she designed integrative programs to address disparities in education, workforce, health, and poverty. Mai Kao earned her BA in psychology from Brown University, an MA in public affairs from the University of Minnesota, and a doctorate in public administration from Hamlin University. Neil, I believe we're going to hear from you first. Thank you, Julie. I really appreciate uh, you inviting me. I appreciate the kind introduction uh, and thank you, Mike Howell. I look forward to our conversation in a few minutes. I'm going to start just for a few minutes to talk about the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, talk about the work of the Federal Reserve, uh, the economic environment that we're in. And then I'm going to uh, look forward to working or talking to Mike Howell and having a conversation with her and taking questions from, uh, from audience members. So let me just start with the Minneapolis Fed. The Federal Reserve is our nation's central bank. We were created by the United States Congress in 1913, and they did something unique they wanted to make sure that the central bank was represented all around the country. So instead of just housing everything in Washington, DC, they decided to break it up and have regional uh, Federal Reserve Banks across the country. There are 12 of them, the ninth of which is here. The ninth Federal Reserve District is Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and Northwestern Wisconsin. A big part of our jobs at the Minneapolis Fed are literally to represent all of you to make sure that we know what's happening here in our regional economy, and then bring these insights back to Washington, DC, when we set monetary policy or we set interest rates for the nation. Now we can't set a different interest rate for Minnesota or for California or for New York, because we all use the same currency, the same dollar, but we want to try to set the right interest rate for the country as a whole that works optimally for the country as a whole. So making sure that the ninth district is represented in that process is very important. Now, before COVID hit, I would spend a lot of my time traveling around our region, doing town hall events in person uh, with hundreds of people and hearing a lot of questions and answers from people. I'd go visit different regions. I'd do meetings with small businesses, meetings with workers, meetings with nonprofits, all to try to give me a richer sense of what's happening on the ground. And then I would go back to Washington, D.C. every six weeks for what we call Federal Open Market Committee meetings, where we deliberate about the US economy and we then set interest rates for the nation. Now, because of the pandemic, I can't go out and we're not going out in person to do that. So here I am, I'm in my basement, literally, and I'm doing as many of these events as possible. So I look forward to the Q and A with my Cal and with all of you to hear from you what's happening on the ground. Now, before the pandemic hit, the US economy was in quite strong position. The unemployment rate was around three and a half percent. We've been surprised over the past several years how many Americans wanted to work. Every time we thought that we were reaching full employment, more Americans came off the sidelines or Americans decided to keep working and not retire. And the US economy showed to have more potential than we thought was possible because people wanted to work. So that was a very 
positive development that surprised us that we hope to get back to again. And then obviously the pandemic hit very, very aggressively and really hammered the US economy. It forced partial shutdown to the economy around the country, huge amount of layoffs, and there's been a reco some recovery since then. You know, just today we saw a jobs report, a national jobs report, where the unemployment rate fell to around 7.9%, but the jobs report was disappointing. Only around 660,000 jobs were created. Given the tens of millions of jobs that have been lost, we are a long way from recovering the job market that we had back in January or February. There are still some 10 or 11 million more people out of work today than we would have expected if we'd had the job market that we had back in January or February. So there's a long way to go in the recovery. Many of my colleagues around the Federal Reserve have said, and I say this as much as I can, that ultimately we have to get control of the COVID virus, get it under control so that we all, you and I and our families feel safe to go back out to restaurants, to go back to, to movie theaters, to go back in person and you know, group environments. Until we get there, we're gonna only have a very muted economic recovery because that's what it's gonna take for us to have a full economic recovery. It's all of us having the confidence to go back to normal. And that means either really crushing the virus and getting it really at very low levels so that through testing and contact tracing, we would have confidence that it's safe, or hopefully we will all have a vaccine that we can take and you know that's safe. Then we can also have confidence that it's safe to go back. Since the pandemic hit, I've been spending a lot of my time with my colleagues at the Minneapolis Fed, uh, talking to the best health experts we can in the country. We have one of the very best in Minnesota here at Dr. Mike Osterholm at the University of Minnesota, who I've spent a lot of time talking to about these pandemics. One of the good pieces of good news is the health experts seem to have more confidence today than they had six months ago that we will in fact have a vaccine at some point. You know, that vaccines, you can't just take them for granted that they will necessarily happen. As you know, we've been searching for an HIV vaccine for decades, still don't have one, but given all of the work and the progress that's been made in vaccine development, the health experts tell me they feel quite confident that one of these vaccines that are uh, being tested right now will ultimately work, or maybe multiple of them will work. But the question is, when is that going to happen? They tell me it's probably going to be middle of next year before we would have a safe vaccine that is widely available, enough of Americans having taken it, that we can then say, okay, it's safe to go back to normal. So for my own planning, and as we think about the Minneapolis Fed and our employees, we're planning that this is a, we have at least another year to go in this pandemic before we can return back to normal. So we all need to uh, stay vigilant. The, let me just shift a little bit. Congress has given the Federal Reserve our, our goals, what we're trying to achieve. We talk about them a lot. One, uh, our dual mandate. One is a stable economy, stable prices, not overheating, not limping along. Another one is maximum employment, which is what I was talking about earlier. When are we going to have an economy that goes back to full strength? Uh, we've said that we're going to keep interest rates low for the foreseeable future until we can provide uh, enough support for the economy bring back those workers, put people back to work, and get the U.S. economy back at full strength. One of the other pieces of good news in this has been Congress has been very, very aggressive. Both parties have come together to support the American people. When tens of millions of Americans lost their jobs, it was just absolutely critical that Congress extended and provided more generous unemployment benefits, not only for those families and those workers, but for all of us. I mean, the reason that when you have tens of millions of Americans out of work, you know, they have bills to pay. They have food to put on the table. They have credit card payments. They have rent payments. They have auto payments. The way they've been able to make those payments is because Congress has been so aggressive in providing them support. That's not just important for those families. That's important for all of us in making sure our economy can recover. So I just saw the news this morning that there uh, appears to be some progress on Capitol Hill to provide uh, continued support both for unemployed people and for businesses that have been dr uh, dramatically affected by this. That's enormously important for our recovery because if we don't provide that kind of support, you're gonna see many more business failures. Already thousands of businesses across the country are failing. If thousands are yet to fail and do fail, that will just slow down the economic recovery and make it a much more muted and costly recovery for all of us. So you know, I'm hopeful just based on the news reports that Congress will step in and provide more support both to workers who lost their jobs and to businesses. I just, I think that's enormously important 
for our economic recovery. And then the last thing I'll just say, just as an opening, and then I look forward to talking, chatting with Mike out, something that Julie mentioned at the Minneapolis Fed, we're doing a lot of work on education, education here in Minnesota. The reason we care about education is because of our maximum employment mandate that Congress has given us. There is no better, no more important determinant of your success in the job market than the education that, that you receive. And so all the students at St. Thomas, I applaud you for pursuing your education. It's going to serve you well in your futures. One of my big surprises and disappointments coming to Minnesota is to discover these huge economic disparities that we have here. I naively thought because Minnesota is so successful on so many dimensions with on average good schools, on average a highly educated workforce, a vibrant business community, I naively assumed that that meant that everybody in Minnesota was doing better. That's just not true. And it turns out we have some of the worst disparities, economic disparities across multiple dimensions and especially in K through 12 education disparities. And so uh, I'm sure that when Mike and I are chatting, we can talk about this, but we have a proposal with the former Supreme Court Justice Alan Page to amend Minnesota's constitution to give every child in Minnesota a civil right to a quality public education. We think by literally pulled it, putting children first in the eyes of the law, this can lead to transformation in our society over time and really a much more vibrant economy, a more, much more competitive economy and a much more inclusive economy for Minnesota. And I'm excited to talk about that. And I'm very excited and honored to partner with Justice Page in that work. So with that overview, uh, why don't I call on Mike Howe. By the way, Mike Howe, my good friend, uh, served on the board of directors of the Minneapolis Fed for six years. In fact, she hired me. So thank you for that, Mike Howe. Uh, she also was the chair of our board of directors for two years. And it was a real privilege to get to work with Mike Howe to learn from her and uh, to watch her and excited about her and her new role in this new School of Public Health. So uh, thank you for that, uh, giving me that opportunity to give this overview. Mike, why don't I turn it over to you? Okay, great. Um, Neil, thank you uh, so much. It's uh, wonderful to get to see you again. I know that you and I personally know each other from, from many years of working together, but um, I thought you could uh, tell us about your college experience uh, because you were an engineer and then you, you shifted and changed to uh, finance and then public policy. Um, what are the moments in your career that you remember that actually brought you to being the president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank? Well, it's a good question, Michael. My, um, my career journey has been kind of a wandering path. There was no real plan. I pursued engineering out of high school because I always liked math and science and, and, and I like building things. So mechanical engineering seemed like a good fit. I picked University of Illinois because it was a very good engineering school and it, I wanted a big uh, university. It's a big public university. And then I chose aerospace because it sounded as exciting for an engineer designing technology for NASA. It was about as cool as it could get and about as challenging as it could get. So that was really exciting for me. I love my work as an aerospace engineer. My managers at the time were encouraging me to go get my PhD. And I knew though that if I got my PhD in engineering that I would really be committing my career to a career of engineering research. And as much as I loved it, as much as it was intellectually stimulating, I wasn't ready to make that form of long-term commitment. So I decided to go get my MBA instead and just learn about business and finance. And that led me, I can't tell you there was any great reason why, that led me into investment banking uh, I got a job at Goldman Sachs in California working with technology companies. But in the back of my mind, it always had a curiosity about government. And when uh, President Bush selected the CEO of Goldman Sachs at the time, Henry Paulson, to become Treasury Secretary, I basically cold called him and said, I want to come with you. I want a chance to serve and learn. And my managers at Goldman thought, well, that's crazy. You're going to give up your career at Goldman Sachs to go be an aide to the Treasury Secretary? you know, what's the matter with you? And I said, well, what's the matter with you? This is a once in a lifetime chance to get to learn, to contribute. And if I don't like it, so what? I go back to the private sector. And if I do like it, it opens a new world to me. And it turns out I love public policy. I just, I just think it's enormously important for the country and it's a real privilege to be a part of it. So um, when I asked you to join the founding board of the Morrison Family College of Health, you actually hesitated and you said, well, I don't know much about health. Um, I'm not sure if I'd be a good fit for this board. And then the pandemic hit um, three months later. <laughs> so I thought I would ask you, um, 
What insights have you gained really as uh, part of the Fed system and being in the key role that you've been watching what's happening with the economy? What's been the impact of, of COVID-19 on our economy? And how do you see education really being um, a part of the solution and or uh, what insights have you gained? Because obviously, uh, if you didn't get it before, if we didn't get it before, um, all of these things are, are interrelated. Yeah, well, you're right, uh, Michael. I said, well, what am I going to contribute to your advisory board? But it's been a uh, wonderful opportunity for me not just to watch you lead the building of your new institution, which is very exciting and ambitious, but to also be on the board with so many other experts and so many public health experts who I've actually had the opportunity to now call and ask for advice about COVID and about pandemics. And, you know, in February or actually in January, none of us were thinking about pandemics. None of us were thinking about COVID. And then we all had to learn as much as we possibly could. And that is relying on the best health experts in the country and in the world to guide us on what is, what's the likely course of the virus. I mean, the virus is dictating the economy. It goes back to what I said earlier. You know, it's funny, if you look around the country and you look around the world, there've been very different policy responses from different leaders. Some states have shut down more aggressively than others. Some countries have shut down more aggressively than others to try to control the pandemic. But what's so interesting is that even though there have been these differences in official policy responses, the economies have all responded basically the same. Why is that? Because people are isolating on their own. They're watching the news, they're reading what's happening and they're saying, you know what, I wanna protect my family. I want to make sure my family is safe so I'm not gonna go out to that restaurant. I'm not gonna go out to that movie theater. And so even though the official policy responses have been different, the economic responses have been very similar because ultimately you and I and all of your students and all of the viewers we are deciding what the economy looks like based on our own behavior. And that's why so much of this comes down to when are we all gonna have confidence that it is safe to go back to normal and then the economy will fully recover. But one thing, just to talk about education, which you asked about, this pandemic has been devastatingly unfair. People like me, I can work from home. So here I am in my basement and at the Minneapolis Fed, we have not had to lay off anybody we've been able to move 95% of our staff working remotely and have been able to do that both safely and effectively. In contrast, if you're working in a meatpacking plant or you're working in a restaurant or you're working in a movie theater or in some education institutions, you've either had a lot of exposure to physical health risk or you've lost your job because those entities have had to shut down. And so it's the folks at the lower income end of the distribution typically have both seen the most exposure to the virus, so the most public health risk, but also the most economic risk because it is those service type jobs that have been disproportionately affected. So this crisis is deeply unfair and those of us fortunate to work in higher level jobs, higher paying jobs that require more education, those are the jobs that have been more easily put online and we've been less affected by this. So it's been a deeply unfair crisis, but it also showcases just how important education is. There's so many advantages to having more education, even some advantages we wouldn't have thought of six months ago. Yeah, so um, so I'm on a, an advisory committee, actually, an advisory group for the Commissioner of Deed, and we are um, giving some advice and, and thinking about the future workforce and also new markets that might be emerging, new jobs, new ways of doing things. As you think about the current and future needs of Minnesota in terms of how the economy is getting restructured as a result of what you're experiencing, what can we do at St. Thomas to prepare our students for what work will maybe look like in the future? You know, anything you can do, and, and this is hard, but anything you can do to give your students uh, adaptability. I mean, you know, one of the, the constants, and this is a trite expression, but it's very true, it changes the constant. Everything is changing. So last week, I, last week or earlier this week, the days all blur together. I did a meeting with a bunch of later labor leaders from Minnesota. And one of the labor representatives represents people who work in the hospitality industry that have been devastated by COVID. And he said that they're already seeing that once the pandemic is behind us, some of those hotel jobs are never coming back. And he said he already knows that major hotel chains are looking at technology. So you don't have to go to a front desk to check in. You look at your iPhone, you confirm your reservation, it tells you your room number, and you use your iPhone to open the door. Uh, it makes a lot of sense when he described it that way. 
So I think that there are going to be continued changes. I think that this pandemic is accelerating those changes and things like working from home. I mean, I think we are all surprised that we've been able to work remotely as effectively as we have. Now, I don't believe that we're all going to be working remotely. I think there are costs and there are losses, but there probably will be more of this working remotely than we had experienced before uh, and less physical, physical traveling. Just as an example, federal open market committee meetings are very formal, great deal of work goes into them. They've always been in person. We've now moved them all online. We have sophisticated video conferencing technologies and they've been very effective. So I think that we're gonna to continue to see changes, but the more you could help your students to feel comfortable with change, to be adaptable, uh, I think you'll serve them well wherever this ends up going. So I wanted to ask you a question about your, your passion around the constitutional amendment and uh, around education, because that's something I have a passion around too. And for many of the same reasons, um, so the Morrison College of Health was set up to actually target and address health disparities um, and to educate our students to um, work in service to the whole person, which means um, not only looking at the absence of disease, but looking at actually what's happening in our community and in our economy and how people are, are living and working. Um, so, you know, why are you so invested in education especially K through 12. Now in higher ed, we experience what I call the aggregated disadvantage over time of the K through 12 system because we are then, um, you know, have additional eligibility requirements. Uh, students have to have had a certain number of years, have a high school degree certainly to enter. But where does this passion for you stem from? And uh, what are you hoping that it will do to create a change in the conversation around education? I'm trying to do that too around health and in higher ed, but you're trying to do it with the K through 12 system. Where does yeah, that come from? Well, I mean, the official answer is I talked about our maximum employment mandate and how important education is. But personally, I just feel like I am the product of, you know, my parents are immigrants from India, but I had a big advantage. They were highly educated and they insisted that my sister and me get a good education. And because I got a good education, every door of this country has been open to me. And I feel incredibly blessed because of that. But the key, the unlocking those doors was the, edu was the education that I received. And I think it is a tragedy for our state. I think it's a national tragedy that so many young people are not getting the good education. You know, I don't believe, this is now a philosophical statement. I don't believe in guaranteeing everybody's gonna have an equal outcome. But I do believe deeply in equality of opportunity that every young person who, you know, in our country should have a chance to reach their full potential. And the only chance that that can, that can be true, that that can happen, is if they get that good education. And so I feel like I'm living proof of what's possible if you get a good education, even if you're from an immigrant family, even if you're not from a wealthy family, doors can be open for you. And that's where my passion for it comes, because I think it's a tragedy that a lot of young people don't have the opportunities that I had. Well, I have one more question for you, um, and then we're gonna turn it over to the audience. I'm getting a lot of questions uh, via the chat here. And I know that when you and I were uh, starting out together, you as the Fed president and me as the board chair, brand new, newly minted, we were sitting around having a conversation actually with Ken Powell, who's, who was the chairman and CEO of General Mills. And, and I said, you know, we really need to think about the economy more broadly than just, just from an economic lens. And then you launched an institute um, to actually look at inclusive economic growth. So tell us about what that has done in the time period that you've been the president and what are you learning through all of that um, exploratory process? Did it better prepare the Fed for what's happening right now? Yeah, Micah, thanks for asking about the, uh, what we call the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute. This stems from what I said earlier, which is I was surprised coming to Minnesota to discover these huge economic disparities. And I asked our researchers, our PhD economists, why do these disparities exist? You know, what's been done to close them? And I, honestly, I got very, very, very few good answers. And the Federal Reserve nationally has brilliant PhD economists, more PhD economists than any other organization in the world. And what I realized is that we really needed to, on a more focused way, aim some of that brain power and really try to understand these disparities. Even if the Federal Reserve doesn't have its own tools to close them necessarily, because we can't target one group or one region with our monetary policy, if we could do the analysis and then on a nonpartisan basis and then arm other policymakers like legislators with that data and analysis, that was an important contribution for us to make. So we launched the center in 2017. 
We recruited a wonderful director of the Institute, Abby Wozniak, a professor of economics from Notre Dame, who was also in the uh, Council of Economic Advisors uh, in Washington, in the White House previously, just a terrific person to lead the Institute. We brought in a lot of scholars from around the country to work with us uh, and to generate research that can help illuminate the, these disparities and propose uh, policies that can change it. There are two goals of this that I see. One is <clears throat> doing that analysis and that research to come up with policy solutions. A second of which is to change the Federal Reserve itself, to make this work more woven into the fabric of things that we think about every day. And I think it's having, pro it's having progress. It's a slow process. Historically, the Federal Reserve has said, <clears throat> hey, these aren't our issues. We're just supposed to be thinking about the aggregate national economy but now I think we're beginning to realize that we do have roles to play and it is important. And so I think that this is like, you know, you're turning an aircraft carrier, you know, that expression. I think we are nudging the Federal Reserve so that this is more in the fabric of what we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm excited about the long-term possibilities of the Institute. Yeah, so I know that there was a, a robust debate on the board of directors, actually, uh, when we were searching for uh, the next president of the Federal Reserve Bank about whether or not that individual needed to be an economist, um, because over the years, uh, there have been many economists who have become Fed president. And one of the reasons why we uh, decided that that wasn't necessarily the case is because um, we wanted to um, actually cast the net wider uh, to have someone who could communicate, understand policy, and actually run the affairs of the bank, right? It's a, it's a big bank in addition to the, the monetary uh, policymaking role. So um, I find uh, that most of the time people really don't understand the unique structure of the central banking function. Um, and we had a whole bunch of questions actually come in. This was right when we announced that first Friday that you would be the uh, guest speaker. Um, and uh, there's some questions here that our audience has about, um, well, what's the difference between fiscal policy and, and monetary policy? And then uh, how does politics fit in there? Um, what if we have uh, a political party change? How does that actually influence the Fed? Oh, great questions, uh, and thanks for asking them. So fiscal policy is uh, what Congress decides with the White House. This is tax policy and spending policy. So how much money do you want to tax the American people? And what's, how much do you want to tax different people and different businesses? And then what do you want to spend that money on? Do you want to spend it on education, on defense, on health care, et cetera? Those are, that's literally, that's the definition of fiscal policy. And that is a political process. So we all have elected representatives. Hopefully everybody will go out and vote. I already voted. I mailed in my ballot, as did my wife. Uh, and, but ultimately, our elected representatives decide how much do they want to tax us and what do we want to spend that on. And that is inherently a political process, and those are political decisions. Separate from that is monetary policy, and that is how much money do we want to put in the economy to try to provide boost to the economy or to try to slow it down. So typically, the Federal Reserve will raise or lower interest rates. It'll typically cut interest rates to make it cheaper to go out and get a mortgage or to go get a car loan or for a business to get a loan to build a factory. By making it cheaper to get a, uh, to get a loan, we stimulate economic activity. Or if it looks like the economy is overheating, we will typically raise rates to then make it more expensive to go get a loan. And then that slows down economic activity. And so Congress in its wisdom said, you know what, we ought to keep politics out of monetary policy. So they're gonna shield the Federal Reserve from politics, leave us free to make the best decisions we can. And then ultimately we're accountable for the outcomes. And that's why the chairman of the Federal Reserve goes and testifies regularly in front of Congress and whatnot. But that's the separation. Taxing and spending is a political decision. How do you manage the ups and downs of the economy with monetary policy? That's meant to be non-political. And I'm really pleased that most elected leaders on both sides of the aisle really respect the fact that monetary policy should be kept non-political. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, thank you for that explanation. Um, I think people often get that confused and they wonder what's all happening. Um, that and I think there's some confusion with monetary policy, the setting of interest rates, and then actually the market, <laughs> which would be the other, the other thing that people get really confused about. Well, I have a question here from an audience member who wants to know, um, to what extent will the massive, massive stimulus packages um, and the trillion dollar deficit actually devalue the dollar over the next 10 or 20 years? 
Um, and then do you see a day of, you know, it's almost like a financial reconciliation happening for all the debt that's really propped up our economy. What, what can you tell us about that or how we should be thinking about it? I'm not concerned about the, the dollar or our competitive position relative to other countries uh, because of this current spending. The U.S. government has extraordinary fiscal capacity, and that's because investors around the world have more confidence in the U.S. economy than they have in any other major economy in the world. So the currencies, whether it's the dollar relative to the euro, the dollar relative to the yen, or any other currency, it's purely a relative measure. So every day, basically, investors and currency traders are making a, a judgment, whose economy is stronger, the US or Europe, the US or China, the US or Japan, and that's roughly how these currencies end up getting set. Basically, investors around the world are saying, we have great confidence in the US economy, even if our political system seems really fractured right now, even if there's a lot of tensions internally, the US economy is still a juggernaut relative to other economies. Now, COVID is hammering us, it's hammering economies around the world, but the fundamental strength of the US economy, where does, it, where does our economic growth come from? It comes from how educated our workers are. So the more we educate our workers, the better our economy is gonna be. And it comes from innovation and technology development uh, and new technologies, whether it's fracking in North Dakota and Texas, or it's new things invented in Silicon Valley, whether it's the iPhone or Uber, uh, the US is still the innovation engine of the world. And so we have the fiscal capacity because we have these amazing assets. We have the fiscal capacity to support the American people through this pandemic. The bigger challenge for all of us is long-term, our demographics are, we're aging as is much of the Western world. Our uh, number of workers that we have for every retiree is trending down because our society is getting older. So we have programs like Medicare and Social Security that are funded by current workers paying for current retirees. And as those ratios go down, because we're having fewer kids than prior generations, those programs are forecast to go up into the red, uh, or the deficit is forecast to go up by quite a bit. And so that's the long-term fiscal challenge that we need to come to terms with. How do we put those programs into balance? My, my own preferred solution is that we have an, a robust immigration system that allows people to come to America to work here, to contribute to these programs, that could do a lot towards trying to put those programs into balance. But ultimately, we need to make political decisions about how to put those programs into balance, because left unchecked, they're on an unsustainable path. That's a really good point. And um, one of the things that uh, um, I think a lot about is how uh, the world has become a lot smaller with how we trade, with how we do business, with global policies. And obviously we're living in a global pandemic. So the public health issues um, and the spread of COVID, uh, how governments have been responding, and then just also how, how everybody is responding across the world economically is, is a little different, but you can see the variations across the world. Um, so I have a question from an audience member about whether or not um, growth can really save us. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a question with an assumption, right? Can growth save us or is growth just allowing world economies to put off hard decisions because of the way we are working, living, spreading disease, doing, doing what we're doing? Well, that's a, a big, profound, uh, almost existential question. I, I think growth is critical. Growth makes the pie bigger. Uh, then, it, you know, then there are separate questions about how that growth and who benefits from that growth and are those benefits shared broadly. Let's assume for a moment that we could have an economic system where everybody can participate and everybody can benefit from that growth, then I think there's no question that we need more growth, both for our sustainable, both for our debts that we've been talking about, to be able to pay off those debts and be in a sustainable fiscal path, uh, but also just for our own uh, well-being for everybody. But making sure that we have a system where everybody can participate is really critical. I'll, I'll say one of the things that was really beneficial in the last few years, as the labor market got tighter, and as businesses were complaining that they couldn't find workers and people started to re-enter the labor force, we actually started to see wage gains, the fastest wage gains at the lower end of the economic distribution. Now it took, it took 10 years to get there after the great recession, which is far too long, but we were finally seeing that everybody at some level was able to participate in the economic uh, uh, growth that we were experiencing toward the end of the expansion there. So I do think growth is absolutely critical but everything we can do to make sure that that growth is inclusive, 
I think that, that that'll be better off. We'll all be better off for that. Board of Fed uh, throughout the recovery from the recession, actually, and could see, you know, labor force participation rates going up, um, you know, all the measures that the Fed uh, put in place, I, I think they were all, all good. You know, the diversity of view from across the country was really special, and it was, it was a, a unique board to serve on, for sure. Um, so uh, I, I, uh, I have a person who asked a question here about whether you foresee a quick, robust job market comeback uh, post COVID-19 pandemic, if there's a vaccine available, or do you think it's gonna be slower than that? What, what's your take on it? Well, uh, it's a good question. Uh, right now, it looks like it's gonna be more of a grinding recovery. So there was a pretty fast recovery in June and July and August of this year, faster than we had expected, but that's a double-edged sword. It's because we reopened before the public health experts said it was safe to reopen, generally speaking, across the country. So great, we're reopening. But then that leads to a resurgence of the virus. And now you're seeing people social distancing and more. You know, we look at some real-time data from Google and other places, cell phone data, and you're seeing, even in the ninth district, you're seeing things trailing off again, retail activity, uh, people visiting restaurants trailing off as the virus is climbing back up again. The real uh, challenge is if we continue to see a lot of bankruptcies. You know, many restaurants, just pick on restaurants for a second. Many of them have said, you know, we're going to run at 50% capacity so we can maintain social distancing. Well, restaurant margins are slim in good times at 100% capacity. How long can a restaurant last running at 25 or 50% capacity? And if you see many more bankruptcies, think about that restaurant. Many restaurants in the Twin Cities have already gone bankrupt or shut their doors for good, which is very sad. Some of the restaurants are blue chip names that were very successful before COVID. Well, they shut the door, they say close permanently, and how long before a new restaurant forms to take that space? Could be six months, could be a year, could be two years or longer. And then they have to refurbish the space, then they have to hire staff. And so the more businesses that go bankrupt, the slower the economic recovery is going to be because new businesses are gonna to need to form to take their place and hire the staff that had been, that had been working in that old business. So, Unfortunately, even with, let's say we have a widely available vaccine a year from now, I'm expecting a grinding economic recovery of slow growth, slow labor market recovery. Then if it's a year from now that the vaccine is widely available, even then I wouldn't imagine an immediate turnaround because there will have been a lot of damage done to the businesses that would have been the employers for all those folks. And I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope it happens much more quickly. A vaccine comes more quickly and the recovery is more robust but I'm not seeing any indication that that's happening. Yeah, so I've got a lot, of, uh, lot more questions about being curious about your background <laughs> and uh, your, own, your own educational experience. So um, I'll start out with a, a story about my sister who went to the Carlson School at the University of Minnesota. I actually went to the Humphrey School and one day we were talking and uh, she was talking about the economy and some other things and and uh, I could actually understand her. So she was like, well, you're, you're like a, a do-gooder, someone who actually helps community and you know, informs public policy. How come you know what I'm talking about? And I said, well, public policy and, and work that is done you know, just on the business end are two sides of the same coin. You need both to work in order for us to have a resilient economy and actually a resilient world. Um, so I have a person here who wants to know how your training as an engineer uh, benefited you in your current position? What were the lessons that you learned uh, through college and through your education? Well, thanks for that question. Uh, engineering training, you know, when I went to, when I first went to Treasury after Goldman Sachs, and I had, had my MBA in finance, I used my engineering much more than I used my MBA. And not, not the thermodynamics or the fluid dynamics that I learned in engineering school, but it's the fundamental skills of problem solving. Policy making is just like engineering. You have a problem and you want to analyze the problem. You tear it apart, understand what are the key components of the problem. And then you have certain tools over here. How do you use these tools to solve the problem that you're trying to solve? That's what policymakers are trying to do. And that's what engineers do. So the fundamental analytical thinking and the analytical skills that I learned in engineering school have served me exceptionally well, uh, more than my MBA, more than my finance. It's the engineering and the problem solving skills that I think are, have really uh, 
enabled me to be effective in my current role. That's not to say that my MBA was not important. The basic finance and accounting that I learned has obviously been important too. But I think the analytical skills I learned in engineering school are really the keys that I, or the foundation that I lean on. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm, I'm friends, obviously, with all the deans, but uh, particularly Dean Kathleen Campbell, who's the dean of the School of Education. And she, uh, she and I and, and you, actually, all three of us share a belief that uh, access to a quality education um, is really a, a basic human right and that it's, it's something that we all have to be doing. Um, so I've got a question here about how you believe this constitutional amendment that you and Judge Page are, are trying to get us to adopt in Minnesota. How, how does that help transform our educational system? What do you imagine this amendment could do for Minnesota? Thank you. You know, if you look back in our nation's history, the biggest transformational changes have come through civil rights, whether it's the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, the freedom of speech and freedom of religion, the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, uh, the, I think it was the 15th Amendment giving freed slaves the right to vote, and then the, the amendment that gave uh, women the right to vote, and of course the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. These have led to transformation in our society over time. They don't lead to immediate transformation, and they've not been perfect. They haven't solved everything, but they've changed the arc of where our country has gone. In Minnesota, we've had education disparities for decades, and there have been many, many attempts to try to close these gaps and zero. We have made zero progress in closing education gaps in Minnesota. And my analysis is basically we've only been tinkering around the edges. We've done a little bit here, a little bit there, because both parties don't agree on what the solution is. So they just do minor things in the middle. I'll give you an example. Uh, in Minnesota, we're very, very proud of the fact that we have open enrollment. You can send your child to any public school you want to, in theory. In reality, that public school, the recipient school, has to agree and you have to basically find your own transportation to get them there. So open enrollment is like lipstick. It's a pretend solution that doesn't really, it does help some students, but it's not big enough and impactful enough to really address the education disparities we have in Minnesota. We have lots of lipstick solutions in Minnesota. So by putting children first, where all children have a civil right to a quality public education, and then holding the state accountable, Justice Page and I think that this can lead to transformation of our education over time. Because if the governor and the legislature don't come together after that constitution has been adopted and, and amended, then if they don't come together to make the changes that are necessary, the transformational changes, then families would have the right to go to court and say that my child's civil rights are being violated, just as if, just as if my freedom of speech were being muzzled. I could go to court and say, hey, somebody is preventing me from speaking, uh, you know, exercising my rights. And so, this is both a carrot and a stick. It's a carrot to say, to say to our political leaders, you need to make major changes. The people have spoken. This is a value of our state. And if you don't, the courts will step in with a remedy that you may not like. And so we, again, we don't think this will lead to transformation overnight, but we think this can change the direction of where our education is going and really lift Minnesota up. Other states have made changes to their constitutions and to their systems that have really closed gaps. This problem is not impossible to solve. If anyone tells you that you have to first solve poverty, that is not true. And by the way, if you want to solve poverty, why don't we fix education? That's probably the best tool we have to solving poverty. This can be done. We just, we just need the political will to do it. Yeah, one of the things that I'm uh, trying to change um, in how we look at the human condition is to actually look at it, uh, not from an, individual, in, an individualistic perspective, but look, about, look at individuals in the context of, of family and in their communities. Um, you know, in other words, little children don't vote. <laughs> they don't, you know, they don't have any active agency. You're, you're a new dad, so you get this. But, you know, we're born the most vulnerable um, in the animal kingdom. We need each other socially and spiritually, actually, to be within the bonds of, of community. And uh, you need the resources to actually get your basic needs met in order to, to uh, to learn and to live and, and to work. Um, so I've really been struck during this pandemic time actually around the rise in mental health issues. You know, our, our students at St. Thomas uh, who want and crave that, that socialization, um, you know, they, they're getting some of it, but probably not enough of it. Um, so I think the, the awakening um, during this time is that individuals don't live separate from each other 
uh, what makes us human is actually being together and that we need those those bonds of, of humanity in order to to do better economically socially uh, physically you know in, in all of its forms and education is a huge part of that um, that picture so uh, you know I think over time um, in higher ed especially and it's great to hear your comments about engineering and the analytical abilities that you learned with that because we we've talked more and more about how there is a demographic cliff that's coming in higher ed uh, how that's going to reshape higher ed and also um, you know what's the defense of a liberal arts education um, at the undergraduate level you know what are the critical thinking skills that we're really um, uh, teaching students to be able to be adaptable and and move out into the world um, so any any last thoughts from you about the value of a liberal arts education and uh, a four-year college degree and obviously we have graduate programs within the Morrison College and beyond as well, but what, what would your reflections about that be? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no question. I mean, we know that not every child is destined to go to a four-year college. It may not be the right fit for everybody. And maybe some get a two-year degree or associate's degree or whatnot, and others go on to graduate school or get a PhD. But it's unambiguous that more education on average, more education leads to better opportunities it's not just better economic opportunities in terms of a better job or better salary. People with more education uh, have better, end up having better access to healthcare because they're, they're in a better economic environment. They have more choices to make sure that they and their families can get the healthcare they need. They do better in the criminal justice system. They're less likely to get involved in crime or drugs or whatnot. Almost every one of the different outcomes in our society, you can look at somebody's education as a pretty strong predictor of where are they going to be in any of these various different dimensions, whether it's housing, transportation, healthcare, criminal justice, more and better education is just absolutely paramount. And so, you know, I just encourage you know, people to keep pursuing their education, recognizing there are huge challenges in this pandemic. You know, people are losing their jobs and maybe they can't afford to go to school anymore because their families lost jobs. I mean, there are huge challenges, uh, but there are also many support programs available. And I know universities like St. Thomas work very hard to provide the support that their students need. So I just applaud all of you for continuing to pursue your education. What I love about my job is that I'm, I learn new things every day. It's like, so far my job has just been a job of continuous learning and getting to work with other, other people who are intellectually curious, who I can learn from. And that's incredibly rewarding to me and it keeps me on my toes. Great. Um, so I, uh... I think that um, you know some of the curiosity about um, just just your passion for education and the things that you're working on have really been been highlighted today, um, and also just your knowledge of the economy and also what's happening globally. Are there any final parting thoughts that you'd share with us? Well, um, for everybody, you know, keep doing what you can to stay safe. It's uh, you know, we we'll probably have another year of this before we will have a vaccine that's widely available. Again, I would love for it to be sooner, but this is what the health experts tell us. And so that's the, that's what I'm basing. My base case scenario is that we've got another year of this in some form and I'm doing everything I can. I'm in a fortunate position, but to make sure that my family stays safe. So we're staying home and, uh, as, as much as possible. We're not doing group activities uh, at all. And so, you know, we're taking it seriously and I hope you all are and we'll, we'll all stay safe and get through it together. Great. Thank you. So, Neil, thank you so much for joining us uh, today and also sharing all of your knowledge and insight with us. It's a pleasure to spend some time with you again. And uh, I'd like to uh, really um, thank the audience uh, today for joining us. And we hope that you can actually join us next time for our next uh, First Friday webinar on November 6th for um, an ongoing and, and a conversation with Dr. Yahuru Williams. Uh, and uh, Archie Black, CEO of SPS Commerce. Uh, they're going to be talking about racial equity and the Racial Justice Initiative at St. Thomas. Thank you, and enjoy your day.